I was doing so many different things throughout my 20s after that show. I was, you know, I was writing a column for the Evening Standard, then I had a fashion brand, then I was doing music, then I was doing acting, I was mm -hmm. chopping and changing careers and trying everything on for size. And then, you know, eventually kind of found my feet and my way in, in what I'm doing now. So your Saturn return is something that happens in your late 20s, so around 29, as Saturn returns to the same place in the sky it was when you were born. And with it, it brings this cosmic coming of age and this initiation into adulthood. And we are confronted by how we have been living our life so far. And if we haven't been living authentically, it can feel like a bit of a drop kick to the face from the universe. You know, especially when I could recognize retrospectively that my Saturn return had really been a proper Saturn return. Like, as in, I'd heard about it, I thought it was a fascinating idea and concept, and it was only when the shit went down that afterwards I was like, whoa. Hey everyone, and welcome back to another episode of A Millennial Mind. If you haven't already, please, 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 can you do me a massive favor and press the subscribe or follow button wherever you're listening or watching to this. Thank you so much for all of your support so far. Let's get into the episode. <laughs> Kagi. Hello. Welcome to Millennial Mind. Oh, thank you for having me. It's so funny, I guess, to have you here because I've watched you on TV since I was like 18 years old. And I was telling I was telling you actually before you came that when you had multicolored nails and made in Chelsea, I obviously couldn't afford to have gel nails at 18. So I was just painting Barry M on my fingers and it looked horrendous. And so it's a full circle moment, I guess, to have you here, but you don't have multicolored nails today, so. I mean, don't look at my nails right now, they look awful. I don't even think mine were gelled, to be honest. Really? No, well, they looked so. really nice. Well, they were painted for you, <laughs> well, unless you're a really good nail painter, because I was absolutely not. <laughs> I didn't do them myself, to be fair. But no, it's so happy to, I'm so happy to have you here today, and I'm very excited to get into your book and your podcast and your journey. Yes, I forgot my book, which is classic me. <laughs> Not the best self-promoter. Could have just had it there. I'll just Photoshop it in if I can. <laughs> just plug it there. We can keep pointing to it and pretend that we're looking at it. But let's start with, you know, you obviously left Made in Chelsea when you were how old? 23. Okay. So 10 years ago. Crazy. You still look the same. Thank you. And then what was your journey like? Tell me. Oh, man. The last 10 years have been crazy. I... I traveled around a lot. I lived abroad. I lived in Sydney. So I moved mm -hmm. to Australia, which is a place that I consider to be my spirit home. Okay. I'm very, very fond of Australians and I'm very <laughs> fond of Sydney. And I had an amazing time there. And then I lived, Maiden Chelsea would have you believe that I moved to New York, but that actually didn't happen. But I did move <laughs> later on to LA. I was doing so many different things throughout my 20s after that show I was you know I was writing a column for the Evening Standard then I had a fashion brand then I was doing music then I was doing acting I was mm -hmm. chopping and changing careers and trying everything on for size and then you know eventually kind of found my feet and my way in, in what I'm doing now. And how did you find that? Because obviously I think one of the things I always talk about is often when you don't know what you want to do, you just have to do something mm -hmm. and you have to find different things and then you'll figure out what you like and what you don't like. But how did you kind of get into this journey? Yeah, exactly. Because I always say, you know, the only wrong step is not taking one. And I say that from a, a place of experience, being quite paralyzed by the fear of what I'm supposed to do or getting things wrong or being judged. And I definitely think after being on the show, I felt that whatever I did next was slightly more mm. um, gonna be judged, yeah. particularly in music. And at that time I was very new to the music industry. I was, I was a new artist, I was trying to discover myself and I felt that there was a pressure for me to kind of come out with something of a certain caliber. And I guess I just wasn't quite ready for that at that mm -hmm. stage um but I'm so glad that I you know had that time in my 20s to explore these different avenues and I think there's also a lot of shame we can experience when we don't know what we're doing or that we feel like we're failing at something and everyone seems to be progressing and if you look at our lives like in our teenage years and we're at school and then university and everyone's kind of in the same boat, doing the same thing, you have exams, you're all doing it. Yeah. And then suddenly in your late 20s, everyone starts speeding up or slowing down and going in different directions. And that can feel quite isolating. So, a, you know, a big message of the book is to try and alleviate the feelings of, of shame and, 
and self-judgment around not knowing because yeah. like you said it's like just do something and commit to something and be an exercise discipline in it because even if it isn't the thing you're supposed to be doing it will set you up for whatever is for sure. and I found that retrospectively looking back at the time that I spent investing in music and in myself in music as a as a writer during my late 20s when I was living in LA even though that's not what I'm doing right now it gave me the sort of foundations to look after myself better mm. because I was dedicating myself to something every day and it doesn't matter that it didn't work out the way I anticipated because it gave me a grounding that I needed to do what I'm doing now. So when I was living in LA and I was feeling those feelings of sort of confusion mm -hmm. and like the opportunities or the, the windows were kind of closing around me, I, um, I then started leaning more into my spiritual practices. And I would say okay. I've always been a spiritual person, but I never imagined that I would be working in that space. And I've always gravitated towards books and personal development and you'd always find me in the self-help aisles of Waterstones. <laughs> um, so it was during that time that I was invited to things and introduced to spiritual teachers like Abraham Hicks and people like that and was sort of leaning into that side of myself more because mm -hmm. I think being away from London and and the sort of social scene that I grew up in gave me the freedom to explore that side of myself okay. uh, without feeling like I'd be judged by it and then you know also sobriety was a big part in that and then when I came back to London I was sort of more anchored in that version of myself and bringing those elements in but it was over those couple of years during my Saturn return where it was kind of like okay we need to fully commit to this and fully lean in and that came about a big catalyst for that was a breakup that I went through. Okay. And yeah, just this kind of feeling of dipping my toe in something but not committing and then just finally finally leaning in. So when that, you say Saturn return, what does that mean? So your Saturn return is something that happens in your late 20s, so around 29, as Saturn returns to the same place in the sky it was when you were born. And with it, it brings this cosmic coming of age and this initiation into adulthood. And we are confronted by our, you know, how we have been living our life so far. And if we haven't been living authentically, it can feel like a bit of a drop kick to the face from the universe. Okay. It's going to kind of snap us back into alignment. And so if you look up your Saturn return online or anything about it, it's got quite a, a punitive reputation as something terrifying, scary that happens to you. And whilst that can be true, it's also, I believe, an amazing opportunity. And it just kind of like strips you away from anything that's not meant for you. And how do you find your Saturn return? How do you find out when it yeah. is? You can find out online if you have your birth time and you can what? see exactly. So you, when you said you're 29, so you could be going through your Saturn return. This right might now. be my Saturn return. Might be your Saturn return. How long is the period? So it's like about two and a half years that it lasts. So something transformative has happened to me recently. So that would be weird if it's the same day. Would it be you the same look, day? You should look up your Saturn return because you may well be going through it right now. You're the right age for it. Mm hmm. This is crazy. I was actually going to ask you why you named it Saturn Returns. Yeah, that's There we why. go. Yeah, that's why. And it was when I was living in LA, someone told me about that I was about to go through my Saturn Return and that, you know, I should expect to be feeling the way I was feeling. And you okay. also have a progressed lunar return, which happens just before your Saturn Return. And that's why it gets a little bit complicated, but that's like at 27. Mm -hmm. And that is also quite turbulent emotionally and then your Saturn return hits and then hopefully you come out the other side feeling a lot more grounded okay. but people will have big shifts in their career relationships often that have felt an alignment through you know our 20s mm -hmm. that perhaps are no longer really at the core of who we are authentically can often wow. can often fall apart and then, 
yeah, there's there's a lot of stuff that goes down. How interesting. So I'm, I'm sure there are a lot of people listening and watching this that are probably thinking, what on earth are you two talking about, okay? <laughs> what do you mean when Saturn returns to its original place from the birth chart? And, you know, I've, I don't know if you've seen all these memes at the moment of when people like Gen Z call into sick and they're like, the moon wasn't in orbit last night. And, you know, the energy is just, you know, my crystals weren't charged and I'm not able to come in today because I'm feeling sick because the moon's in the wrong place, okay? So I've seen a lot of these memes and, you know, Someone actually said to my boyfriend, the moon wasn't, you know, some, there's something about the moon. So he wasn't able to go into work that day. And my boyfriend was like, what do you mean about the moon? And whenever I'm having a bad day, someone will be like, it's the red moon lunar cycle. And I'm like, <laughs> I love it. What does that mean? So can you tell me how do the, does the moon, finally, can someone tell me, how does the moon affect my mood? What is the actual I love, well, correlation? I just, I, I've got to say, I live for astrology memes and I just love all of that stuff. And I've got a lot of friends now that are in this space that just, when they tell me what's going on and, and, and do my chart or do, you know, sinistry readings and stuff like that, it's just insane what, what they know. But in okay. terms of how the moon affects us, if you think we are, the majority of us is made up of water mm -hmm. and, the, and the moon, you know, has that effect on the tides. So it's inevitably going to have an effect on us. And within the cycles of a moon, I also really like to kind of connect it with a woman's cycle, like a woman's menstrual cycle. Okay. So if you actually see those two always used to be considered basically one of the same and women when they are together I mean we're going off on a bit of a tangent here but they would bleed at the same time and then if you actually align that with the moon it kind of tells you something about yourself so whether that's happening on a full moon or dark moon or a new moon and then you can kind of like tap into what's happening in that kind of cycle so within okay. the moon's phases and if you want to get someone on to talk about the moon you could get Kirsty Gallagher who's one of my best friends and she yeah. is knows everything so okay. I'm not even gonna try and pretend <laughs> I know nearly as much as she does but the the phases of the moon that I particularly like is the dark moon which is just before the new moon and that's when I feel most impacted because it often stirs a lot of like emotional stuff that's going on so it's like it's a dark time mm. it's an inward time where you feel that stuff that you haven't confronted or things that are irritating you or frustrating you come up. Mm -hmm. And so you can feel quite dark and kind of down. Yeah. And then the idea is that with the new moon, you then kind of clear that and you make the intention to clear that and then reflect on that the next time the cycle comes around. So if the, you'll often notice it when you start paying attention to a moon's, the moon cycle, that themes will reappear. And so it's the opportunity within it is to start using that as a framework to let stuff go and to manifest stuff into your life as well. Astrology is um is so broad, isn't it? And I guess so broad. It's quite difficult sometimes to get into these things when you don't really know much about them. So how did you kind of tap into the astrology side? Because spirituality and astrology are linked, but they're not, you know, the same thing necessarily. That's true. And I would say that um it was probably connecting with Nora, who does, she's the resident astrologer for Saturn Returns. And she reached out to me on Instagram in 2017, I think it was, when I was doing music and I was releasing music. And we just developed a bit of a relationship online. Okay. And just like, and she then would sort of ask me stuff about my birth time or whatever and then would do my readings and say oh this is going on for you you should watch out for this time and it sort of ignited a bit of an interest and fascination okay. and then I don't know I then started to kind of combine those things or they all fell into place at the same time where you know especially when I could recognize retrospectively that my Saturn return had really been a proper Saturn return like as in I'd heard about it I thought it was a fascinating idea and concept but it wasn't like when I was going I knew exactly when I was going to go through it or was watching for things to happen it was only when you know, the shit went down that afterwards I was like whoa that was a Saturn return and then I wanted to kind of bring these elements together and for me personally I just I enjoy anything that's a bit mystical, magical, the esoteric, this, you know, outside the, the sort of drawing outside the lines a little bit. Mm. And the podcast and, and the book kind of ties all those elements together because 
I love personal development and I yeah. love spirituality, but for me, astrology gives it this really beautiful umbrella that we can view things through. And it means that it's it gives you a better understanding of, of self and your own sort of internal landscape, but also how to kind of navigate things that are gonna happen in your life. Like an, like an internal navigation system of like, okay, there's gonna be a little bit of traffic. Right. You know? Give me an example, because, you know, often I think if you fo- I truly believe whatever you focus on will happen. So if I said to you, Kagi, you know, tomorrow you're going to get a weird energy and someone, you know, you have to be alert around people around you, then don't you feel you'll be a bit more closed? Yes, and I am slightly more, I, a little bit more skeptical of psychics and tarot because... Okay. And I do use both those things, but I'm very particular about who I work with because like you just said, mm. if you have a charlatan doing it and they sort of give you bad, inf- like you know, negative news and there's no real basis for it aside from that they've said the cards says it's so, yeah. then that can be quite a disruptive thing in your life. And then you might always think about it or they could say that you know the relationship you're in isn't right or something like that that happened to me yeah and that's not how it should be and that's not professional but astrology is not really like that it's more like you can see tricky transits and trouble spots but it's not like this is all going to go wrong you know it's like this area might create friction because of this so actually it can be really helpful so you can see like between you and another person based on your charts and your compatibility, what areas of tension there might be. And actually rather than that being something that creates more tension, it means that when it comes, because it's so abstract in a way when you hear about it, it's not until it's coming up that you can recognize and go, oh, okay, that makes sense. And that's why, (sighs) so if you have like, okay, so I have a, a Pluto, I have Pluto conjunct Venus with my Venus, which means that there's the possibility for me to be, um, it's it's like a, a tricky thing that I have in my chart that can mean there can be like some jealousy okay. or, or things around trust. Okay. And so that's something that I can be aware of in the context of relationships in my life. So I'm, I know that that's a thing that I have. Mm. And then for you know the the big three they say your moon your sun your moon and your rising and so within that a sort of school of thought is your sun sign is like your identity or who you are supposed to blossom into in this life so i'm a taurus and then your moon sign mine's a pisces is your sort of internal world and like who people that are very close to you will see but it's not the side you necessarily present but it's the side you resonate with most okay and then your rising sign which mine is libra is kind of how you how people perceive you how people see you but also how you navigate through life to get to your sun sign so in my chart taurus is like where i'm heading towards and taurus is all around sort of luxury and Mm. stability and earthiness and and groundedness. And my Pisces moon means that I'm kind of more watery and like fluid and very emotional, very in Mm. my feelings, hard to distinguish whose feelings are mine and whose are the other person's. (laughs) But then my Libra rising is like how I kind of go from that to something that's more stable and grounded. Okay. And Libra is about relationships. It's about fairness. It's very sociable kind of people um, balance. So I'm a cancer. Yes. I don't know my other two. Is that really an accurate reflection? Well, I mean, cancers are, again, you know, it's a water sign, so it's very emotional. Very emotional. Sensitive. Very sensitive. I've found cancer are very loyal. Yeah, I am quite loyal. Very loyal people. Um, care a lot about their friends. Mm-hmm are very like invested in their friendships. Um, yeah. But, you know, if I'm honest, when I've seen loads of star signs, first of all, I'm like, who wrote these? Because what do they mean? Like, do you know, do you know the origins of it? Well, I think it's become a bit 
well, it's become very watered down. Right. And you can see the sort of renaissance with it now that people are obviously enjoying it. Yes. And I think social media is kind of given, it plays a big part in that. But yes. also I would say that because we've moved away from religion in many ways, like Correct. in the way that it offered a framework to people and that's and that was part of everyone's, it, you know, daily lives. Mm. And when you pull that away, I think that we do as human beings have an appetite for that, you yeah. know, something slightly outside our comprehension. And I think that astrology is kind of seeping its way back into our day-to-day -day lives as a bit, you know, filling that gap perhaps. Mm -hmm. And also because things feel so uncertain in so many ways in the world right now, astrology gives people a sort of, Compare. oh, well, this is happening right now and that's why. <laughs> and look, like my approach to it, obviously I, I love it and I believe in a lot of it, but I'm not puristic about it. I don't I don't let it govern my life, even though it would probably sound like I do given everything I've just said. But I like it as a framework from which to sort of of storytelling. Yeah. And and you know, I say this in the book, I, my belief in its importance is that if it has meaning to someone, it matters. And I think so for what, whoever you are, whatever your belief system, if that allows you to navigate and live life more fully and more joyfully, then, I, you know, and it's not harming anyone, then mm. do, do so. I think being self-aware is, you know, such a great trait to have. And often it's difficult to know what means something to you and what doesn't. And I found that a lot of my friends who are into astrology have, like, echoed what you've said in terms of, I wasn't aware about this and it kind of guided me in this way. So I explored it a little bit more. And now I know that it means something to me. And I think that, you know, same with crystals, you know, I wear mine and never take them off. They're from soul space. And, you know, some people are like, why do you wear them? First of all, I was like, I love them. They look nice. But secondly, they provide me up with a comfort. And it's, I know it sounds bizarre and I know it sounds weird, but I also think of it as like a lucky charm. You know, when people are watching football and they wear their football t-shirt because mm -hmm. they believe it's yeah. absolutely not going to impact the game, but they feel, you know, part of it and they feel it's lucky for them. I almost think that every crystal what well, every crystal does represent something and so when I'm struggling with something I always know that it's on my wrist and it almost gives me the subconscious message of it's there to protect you you have this with you so it doesn't matter mm -hmm. and often that can allow you to really block out any negative noise and it can almost give you some confidence sometimes when you're lacking it because you believe something is there to help you mm -hmm. so I think that there's some people who are obviously going to be skeptical about it. And that's also fine because that doesn't have to be your belief. But essentially, I think if you're using it in a positive way that's impacting you, then that could be good. Mm -hmm. So going back to the original thing, we've obviously digressed so much. So you started Saturn Returns as a podcast. What made you kind of fall deeper in love with that process in terms of, you know, you talk a lot around self-love, you talk a lot around relationships and letting go. What were some of the key moments where you felt like it really helped you? As in doing the podcast helped me. Yeah, I guess during the podcast, you're exploring different avenues, right? And you were talking to different people. What were some of those key messages that you kind of resonated with? Well, I, you know, the beautiful thing about doing the podcast is I'm glad I started it when I did because, you know, everything that I discussed about, you know, Saturn is very associated with karma, responsibility, discipline, like committing to something. And then I felt like, that the podcast in many ways was the first thing that I fully committed to. You know, I was quite wishy-washy with everything before and I, I wouldn't really give things a shot long term. I would sort of like dip in and out. And actually holding myself accountable in the process of doing the podcast and having the conversations with people that I have get have had have had has been so amazing and grounding for me and as much as the listeners get something from it and it seems to also you know I love when people message me saying I lis listened to this episode just when I was going through this it mm -hmm. found me at the perfect time I also am having the conversations just when I need to and within that sometimes I delay releasing them because I don't feel like I've processed things enough and there's that sort of boundary that I have to set within myself of like okay that that brought up a lot of vulnerability. Yes. Let's give this a little bit of space because I know once it's out and I start get, getting messages, if I don't feel like I've processed stuff fully, it's going to feel 
it's going to feel too much and too much of an overshare. So, I mean, I've had some incredible conversations. I've got to learn so much, but particularly I think that the ones around relationships always land for me because I think it's a subject that we know so little about and yet we are all, it's the thing, you know, we all want love Mm. and we all want to love and be loved. And yet we have... We learn nothing about it at school. It's only through our own sort of heartbreaking experience that we figure it out. And often we still get it wrong again and again. So I think that there's so much in that subject. And I also believe that our capacity and ability to love another or a level of intimacy we can go to with someone is a direct correlation to where we can meet ourselves. That a a partnership is always a mirror. Yeah. Um, And that you know, I'm twice ruled by Venus, if we want to bring it back to astrology. (laughs) So it makes sense that that's a topic that I enjoy. And then also the sort of self-worth stuff, like that's something that's a a constant work in progress for me. But it's been my experience that the more vulnerable and truthful I can be and can share that side of myself, In turn, it invites other people to do so, but it also has made me feel a lot stronger. And that's a sort of paradoxical thing, I think. So going to the relationships thing, you know, for some reason, I always attract Geminis, Mm. right? And I feel like Gemini's the worst star sign to be, isn't it? It's just everyone when you say a Gemini. star sign where people get a little bit like... People are like, like that's their immediate reaction. Thank God I'm not a Gemini. I always thank God every day I was born in July and not June. But for some reason, I always date Geminis. I've I've recognized that as a pattern. And I think my nervousness around, I guess, doing like a birth chart, because, you know, I'm Indian and within our culture, you know, astrology is huge, Huge, by the way, huge. And people base things on like a face reading, like a birth chart, all of that. But my parents were never, never really into it. So you, when you were born, you're meant to choose from like these letters. Mm-hmm. My parents didn't stick to the letters. They just named us whatever. And But there are some people within our community who are really, really, really into it. And they actually, when people are getting married, align the birth charts. Now that scares me a little bit because what if they say you're not compatible? Well, that's, I mean, I don't know how, how much that plays a role in them actually picking a partner. How much does it? Well, I guess, I guess if someone told me, me and my boyfriend aren't compatible, I would be like, What does that mean? That's when I tend to sort of dismiss it because I think that it can be a useful tool. But if you're in a happy relationship with someone and someone comes along and says that you're incompatible based off your birth chart, I would I would really just not pay any (laughs) attention to that because, yeah, you know, it's not you. You ultimately make these decisions for yourself. Mm -hmm. You still have free will. It doesn't mean that you are going to be doomed because a birth chart incompatible and actually I don't know is your boyfriend do you have a boyfriend now yeah yeah we haven't done a birth chart reading whatever no. it's called it's, I don't know if it's a compatibility test I think it can be nice in terms of seeing where there might be points of friction yes and which I think- there inev- inevitably is in every relationship but not as a, oh, is this person right for me or not? And I think a lot of people have told me as well, a good astrologer will never say, you know, you're going to break up or this is bad. He will say, you know, these are the errors you're aligned. These are the errors where sometimes you might, you know, have a bit of friction or you might argue about whatever. Mm -hmm. But I have had some readings done before and I remember getting this reading done from this astrologer and he, I guess also, I'm a little bit skeptical because there's always this debate around, do you believe in people who can predict your future or is there free will? Now, I'm also weird because I believe everything happens for a reason and I really believe in timing. So you know how you've just said you've had conversations with people on this podcast, on your podcast at a particular time. I feel like I've also had conversations where I'm like, I really needed to hear that today or you've really come into my life for a reason because I have no idea how I got in contact with you and I have no idea why we're having this conversation, but you've impacted me in a way that no one else could have in this moment. Mm -hmm. So I really do believe in that. But a lot of people have this debate and a lot of people have this kind of paradox of, well, if everything's meant to happen for a reason and everything's written for you in life and your destiny is your destiny, then is there such thing as free will? I don't think it's fate versus free will. I believe it's a dance between the two. And I think that we have opportunities and sort of timelines that are presented to us. I sort of imagine that like, you know, there's many, many, many different ones going on simultaneously that we could pick. Mm -hmm. And 
it's up to us like which ones we decide on. Like we are the masters of our fate, but there are things that are going to come into our life as opportunities and we okay. might not be ready for them and we might reject the opportunity, but I believe then it will come around in a different form. So I think, you know, we have the lessons and the experiences that we have to go through in life. And I, I enjoy astrology as a kind of a tool for that, but that doesn't mean that you don't have free will. So do you believe that people can predict your future? No. Okay. I think, again, that some people have gifts mm. and like some people have gifts and they have, you know, they can co connect with other realms and communicate things yeah. and they can bring things into your awareness, but they don't, should never speak in absolutes. So it, it, it's more, this is an opportunity that will be presented to you. Correct. But you can say no to it. Or you can, you know, you might not show up that day for whatever reason. Like, But it's there. The energy of it is there. And I believe that people have the ability to do that. To tap into that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah just before we, you know, we, we started recording, you told me this, this girl next to you kind of sensed an energy around you. And I, and I truly believe that. I think, you know, genuinely when you meet people, you'll be able to tell if they've got good energy or not. 100%. And I, I released a video on that. And some people were like, well, what if your energy is actually your paranoia? Okay, so this is a really interesting one and something I often come back to, whether it's intuition or fear. Mm. And that's essentially the same thing. It's like, are, are you getting an intuitive hit about something being off? Or are you allowing past experiences or like negative thoughts to play on loop that are now manifesting in a physical form and making you feel like you're having an intuitive feeling that something's yes. wrong. And that is hard to discern because mm. I often find myself thinking something, thinking that it's an intuitive thing and it's actually not. It's just fear. paranoia, fear. And what I try and come back to in those moments is like, we always have a choice between, again, we always have free will between feeding the fear or feeding love. And we cannot, fear is often just a byproduct of a mind trying to control and protect itself. So it's trying to assess where the threat is in any situation. Whereas like, when our, we all also have a very instinctive sort of animalistic thing where, you know, you might find yourself in walking home and suddenly like have this feeling that something's off mm. and it and it is there's someone you know a, about to mug you or whatever it might be and I think we've all had those things where we've sensed danger yes. and we perhaps haven't actually had anything in our sort of more lineal logical mind to back it up so we've almost gone into it mm -hmm. and that could be in any kind of shape or form it could be you know, something as scary as being mugged, or it yeah. could be going into a relationship with someone that we're like getting a really bad feeling about, but but everything on the surface seems great. Yes. And I, I liken it in the book to, you know, animals have this instinctive thing where they'll sense danger and they'll run. Whereas we can often sense danger and like call up the girls and have a glass of wine and convince ourselves it's a good idea. Wow. So. I think that it's a, it's a tricky one to be able to distinguish, mm -hmm. but usually a kind of rule of thumb around this is like your fear or your paranoia is quite loud Correct. and quite repetitive. And it's like uh, voices going again and again and again. Whereas your intuition is more of a quiet whisper. Yes. And so if you are struggling to discern which one is speaking or which one it is, get quiet, mm. get grounded, calm the mind down, stay off cof coffee, <laughs> stay off, stay away from anything, <laughs> any substance that's going to like amp that up. I think we all like, definitely I have a, a habit of when I'm feeling a bit anxious or fearful, I'll like drink loads of tea. You and do. it makes it a thousand times worse, but it's almost like you're kind of yeah. putting gas on the fire, do you mm -hmm. know what I mean? So actually, you want to really ground and stay away from anything like that and just find like a calm place, play some music that's gonna. Yeah. Yeah. I think what you've just said as well is 
if it, there, there is a difference between having an intuition about something and also having that paranoia because often when you're paranoid, it means that you've been in that position so many times before. So let's just yeah. take this for an example of, you know, I've got this bad intuition from you, Kagi, today, yeah? If I had a bad intuition... Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. <laughs> but let's just say as an example, I did. Imagine if I said, well, every time I sit down with a podcast guest, I get a bad intuition from them. That should help me actually uncover, well, this happens every time, Shivani. So maybe you're scared about the guests. Maybe you're nervous around them. Maybe you feel closed off from them. But let's say, which I've never had with any guest here, I've never, ever, ever had a bad feeling. And let's say one day when I sit down with someone I do, I would probably listen to that because it's never, ever happened before. But I would always question it. And I think you know, often we're so scared to share our insecurities and we're so scared to share why we feel off with someone. And often that could be deep rooted in jealousy or envy or worry or expectation. Mm -hmm. Or also in terms of self-love, like, I don't think I'm good enough to sit here with you, mm -hmm. which is why I feel a bit more nervous around you, which is why I feel a bit more closed off. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the things you've spoken about as well is just to really confront a lot of your feelings and to communicate them. Mm -hmm. And from being in a relationship previously to now, I think one of the best things that me and my boyfriend have learned to do is just communicate. And I always tell him, if you're feeling insecure about something, it's 20 times better to just say, I know I'm being illogical and I feel insecure, but I am just a bit annoyed about this. And I do the same now and I mirror that. And I just say, this is totally illogical but I feel, I'm feeling really insecure and really upset about this. And he's like, I actually understand why you would based on this, mm -hmm. but just to let you know that, you know, you shouldn't. Mm. And it's so uncomfortable to say that. It's so wildly uncomfortable to say, I feel really insecure about this really small idiotic thing that I know it's embarrassing to say out aloud. But in doing that, we're able to just communicate so much more effectively. And the more and more you do something, the less scarier and the less cringy and the less embarrassing it becomes because it just becomes a way in which you are learning about each other and understanding each other's deepest thoughts. And that way your relationship strengthens. A hundred percent. And it, like you said, it's it's a lot easier said than done. For sure. But when you start practicing that trust muscle, you have that new form and that new pattern of behavior to go, okay, something's coming up. And also to kind of go back to your question of how, how do we know mm. Where, if we are, if we do put, apply it to the context of a relationship, if you have something that's coming up as an insecurity or a fear or a paranoia and you don't know, mm. bringing it to the table, but having ownership over it, because I yes. think we're very quick to like project it onto the other person. Yeah. And actually within that, we're sort of subcontracting our own authority and we're putting them in a position of, of I don't know, that they're responsible for how we're feeling, whereas that should never really be the case. So and when you bring it to the table, you will be able to tell pretty quickly whether it's an intuitive thing, a fear, a paranoia, because their reaction will tell you everything you need to know. And like you said, when we can like master that communication, mm -hmm. relationships become, yeah, they go through a rhythm of it a lot quicker. You know, you don't 100%. allow things to get to the point of, and I am very guilty of of burying my thoughts. I still okay. I still am sometimes rather than uh, communicating them straight away. I'll allow them to kind of Why? ruminate. Um, God, that's a big question because I don't. To be honest, I don't entirely know. I think it's something I'm still trying to work out in myself. I think that. Yeah, I'm not sure, but it's something I still find hard to do. I just don't think we're like conditioned to do it, especially yeah. as women. I 100%. think it's like, you know, we're, we're told to be good, nice, agreeable, polite girls. Yeah. And so the idea of going, hey, I'm having this irrational paranoia about this thing, it just doesn't feel comfortable because I do, you don't want to be a burden to someone and you don't want to seem crazy or like yeah. all the things that we get labeled and so you kind of bottle it up and just go along with things until until you explode one yeah. day and that's something that you know I think a lot of people relate to and struggle with and it go look it goes both ways like men have their own reasons for struggling to communicate things because perhaps it might make them feel unmanly to say yeah. that they're feeling insecure about a relationship or whatever. But it's definitely true what you just said, that regardless of the reason, it's so much better 
to communicate it because ultimately, even if it does affirm your fear, <laughs> you're better off finding out sooner rather than later. Absolutely. But sometimes we just are so afraid of that possibility that we'd rather just shy away. I think for me, I always think about, do I want to make this relationship, this friendship, whatever it is, work? Is this issue important to me? And if it is, I almost force myself to confront it and to communicate it, mm. even though it's so uncomfortable. Because when I don't communicate and when I don't want to speak about something, it's either I don't want to uncover either my responsibility in the situation or it's the fact that I just don't care. Mm. Because if I no longer care, then there's no point me bringing it up because I don't want to know what's happened. Mm. But sometimes in certain situations where it's really, really difficult to bring it up, it's because everyone has a part to play in, in every situation. And it's too scary sometimes to admit that you have fault, but also that you are insecure. And, and look, we are all insecure about something or the other. Everyone can look at someone and think that's so amazing about them, but have no idea what battles they're, find, they're fighting totally. within themselves. And I think confrontation is such a great tool because it's, it's labeled as such a bad thing. And I talk about it in all my podcasts, but it's a way to solve a problem. And the only way you're going to solve something is if you talk about it. Yeah. But it, it, but it, but it is uncomfortable. I never used to be like that when I was younger. I would bottle it up, scream it all out, and then think, "Oh my god, why did I just say that?" And now I'm never going to say anything again because I can't communicate. Yeah. And it it comes into my life in in every area because I have historically been someone that adopts the sort of head in the sand approach and yeah. hope when I resurface everything will <laughs> figure itself out. But like you said, whether it's friendship or prof like professional life or relationship it is a gesture actually right. of your care and commitment to something and I've had it um when friends like recently not that long ago when friends have kind of called me out on stuff yeah and I found it really at first sort mm. of confrontational and uncomfortable but now retrospectively I'm like that's so amazing that they cared enough and that they value you. our relationship to say, hey, this isn't making me feel good. Like, can we talk about it? Yeah. And can we work on it? And I think, you know, we are very quick to avoid that stuff in friendship and especially as women to kind of go behind each other's backs and yes. be like so and so is doing this and just bitch it up which temporarily makes us feel better but it doesn't really solve the issue exactly and we don't practice enough bringing it to the table with our with our friends and going hey and it's not to emotionally offload it's like like you say, it's a gesture of it is. valuing the, the relationship and the other person. And I talk about this in the workplace. I actually have a five-step framework on how to approach confrontation because people find it. <laughs> Can I have it? Yeah, I'll send it to you. <laughs> but, you know, the, the first step, you know, underneath all of it is compassion, but the first step is care. Now, whether you're, you're at work or whether it's your partner or whether it's your relative, the first thing you need to say is the only reason I'm bringing this up with you is because I care about you. And I, I want to, us to know each other better because, you know, I'm not a mind reader and neither are you. So some things that are going to annoy me are perhaps not going to annoy you. Yeah. And some things that are going to annoy you are not going to annoy me. Mm -hmm. So the first step is always care. And then the second is cause. So I'm going through the framework now. If we didn't, if, if we didn't, if we didn't know we it. were doing it. <laughs> the second is cause. So, you know, what caused the issue? This is what upset me, whatever. The third is to understand their opinion. So I can't even remember the word now. I think it's consider. Okay. The third step is to consider. So you consider their perspective. So let's say for example you, your boyfriend didn't help you you know bring the shopping bags in you could have said I understand that you know it wasn't important for you to help me carry heavy stuff but because I've hurt my shoulder I would have expected you to consider that and that's why I was upset so like small things like that to like understand their perspective then the last step is cure what's the solution mm. so how are you going to make sure that that doesn't happen again so there you go there's my five steps I love that work. I can you send that to me I'll send it because that you. is honestly like people don't have the tools and if you are a people recovering people pleaser like myself mm -hmm. it's achingly uncomfortable because you associate confrontation with aggression 100%. and perhaps you had experiences growing up where it looked that way and, yeah. and it was modeled in a way of like intense conflict Correct. whereas actually conflict doesn't have to be it can like you can navigate it in a healthy way it's so true but um yeah those are really really helpful and you can apply like you can apply it to everything. everything so I actually talked about that when I went to do these workshops in workplaces and I'd always say to people you know start with care and someone said to me how am I going to tell my manager I care about them I was like well obviously to your manager you're not like I love you yeah. and you mean everything to me and I wouldn't live my life without you but there is that element of I really love this company 
And it's important that, you know, there's a good relationship because culture is really important to me. And that's how you word it. You don't say, you know, you love your manager and you can't live without them. You know, people yes. take it to the extreme, but you can apply that to everything because cause, consider and cure, they're very easy to apply to the workplace. But the care element, I think, is different when you're obviously speaking to your colleague. It's yeah, it's, it's of course know, less emotional. But you know, how many people can relate to at home when their partner like leaves the Lucy up or something, for and sure. there's just an explosion because it's like so for them, they're like, "What the fuck is happening?" Yeah, like this is such a small minor thing, but they haven't communicated why that matters or the like several things that have led up to that explosion and then you create this sort of unnecessary fracture because you can't when you're meeting conflict from a place of heightened emotion and yes. anger and just blaming and shaming the other person they're not going to open themselves up or be willing to find the cure it's so or, true or find like the way the next time that stuff happens they can do something different and you then end up just repeating it. That's why I think confrontation is so important because I almost think of it as like a block. So if you think about like a Lego block and you don't address it the first time, then you're building it up the second time, the fourth, and you've got like six blocks. Mm -hmm. But when you're then blasting that person, you're bringing up all of that stuff that <laughs> yeah. they have never heard about. So like you did this in 2009, yeah, 2017. I that. So and I think, think, yeah, and, I and the other person's like, what the hell? You didn't even, I didn't even know. And you could be doing the most annoying thing. Now it's very difficult when someone's annoying. You know, I, I once was with someone and they, every time they used to drink, they used to like drink something and then they go, ah. How do you tell someone that's annoying? You can't just say <laughs> it's annoying. If every time they drink something, they're like, it's just so annoying. It's like slurping. But I just had to one day being like, I think one day I did flip and was like, oh, you've got to stop doing that. And they were like, doing what? And they didn't realize that for years and years and years that they had done that. Anyway. I think well, I was, I'm not going to repeat it because it's inappropriate, <laughs> but a friend was telling me that at work, he was sort of getting shit like every time he went in and was just not saying anything, just taking mm -hmm. it on because that was just what people did. And one day he came in and snapped and said something so rude that the whole office was like, whoa. What did he say? <laughs> I can't say. But he was like, oh, oh shit. <laughs> might have taken, but it was just, you know, like Explosive. seven months yeah. of internalizing that that he just yeah. exploded. <laughs> <laughs> I can't have a serious conversation. With you. I'll tell you. All. <laughs> I think that yeah. Anyway, so confrontation is you know I think it's a really important tool, and I hope that framework is helpful for everyone who's been listening. I'm going to do some some more around that because as much as the care element is the first step and the most important, it's the hardest step because if you're angry at someone, it's so yeah. hard to say you mean something to me. Yeah. It's much easier to detach. Mm -hmm. And you know, letting go is something you speak about a lot. So letting go for a lot of people is very difficult in terms of, you know, a job or a relationship or anything that's a massive change in your life. And obviously you've moved from LA to, well, you lived in Australia for about a month, right? And then you came back here. I was there for seven months. Oh, wow, mm. sorry. You were in Australia for seven months. Mm. And how long were you in LA for? Two years. Moving across countries, and obviously you let go of a really hard relationship. And that's something that a lot of people speak to me about is when you're with someone and you know they're not right for you, how do you let go? Mm -hmm. And what are some of those tools or all those coping mechanisms that you that you went through? Well, there's a couple of things in that that I find really useful. I think when we go through a breakup, what we have to remember is that what we are grieving mm. and to make space for that grief, but also what we're grieving a lot of the time, like a huge component of it is a hypothetical future rather than like the reality, you know. Mm -hmm. And yes, there is the very real thing of that person's presence no longer being in your life and and I say in the book the heart and the body don't under, don't know the difference between whether someone's like dis do you know what I mean yeah. so they're just grieving their absence but also we attach so many expectations and are we imagine that our futures are going to intertwine with this person and, and we're going to you know have this house and we're going to have this family and there's so much pain in letting that go. And there's also, it brings up a lot of fear because we're suddenly faced with this blank canvas all over again. And that can be a terrifying thing. And so I think it's just allowing yourself the space to grieve. And then the other thing that I find really useful to come back to when you are 
because like you're going to be going through waves of grief when when you break up with someone and even if you know that it was the wrong thing it doesn't mm-hmm. mean that you're not going to experience it, that feeling of loss and sadness but there's a quote I think it's Elizabeth Gilbert which is there's no such thing as one way liberation. So ultimately, if it liberates one, it liberates the other. And I think that's a really, really useful thing to come home to because if one person has said this isn't right for me, even if you don't feel it at the time and you think that you are right for me, eventually, eventually, I promise that people will realize and recognize that actually it wasn't and that something far better and far more aligned was around the corner. And it's just about surrendering to that and trusting that a little bit. And I think that, you know, we do try and control a lot of stuff in our life. And I think when you realize that actually you can't control very much, you can control how you react to things. And that's kind of about it. Mm -hmm. And knowing that you can hold yourself in safety and wholeness and, you know, an opportunity. when a relationship ends, there's so much opportunity for personal development in that. There is. Because you can reflect on everything you've learned. And, you know, my mum sent me this really beautiful quote and it's like, we're here to grow in wisdom and to learn to love better. And I just, I love that because, you know, any opportunity or any experience of love is something that should be celebrated. And I think that we attach a lot of expectation onto whether that lasts forever and that if a relationship ends it means it's a failure and I don't think that's true I think Mm -hmm. even things that have failed like if we could change our practice around breakups and actually have a closing ceremony together and actually show gratitude for each other and everything that we learn like how beautiful would that be yeah and you know to tie into the the energy stuff we've been talking about cord cutting can be quite a powerful technique in in breakups because when you are with someone you get very you know your energies are very intertwined and you're very connected Mm. and cord cutting is a a sort of spiritual practice that disconnects you from that person's energy and like you know whether that's just simply having the intention to do so it's incredibly powerful because often if we're not if we didn't want it to end, mm. we will hold on to that cord and it can become really burdensome and we can carry it around for years. So you have to kind of make conscious intention to release that person and release them from your life and send them love. Yes. Send them love. And like, there's so many like beautiful ceremonies and stuff that you can do, do just for yourself. So I I think there's so much... Uh, wisdom in the pain of breakups I agree I think you know break when I've had a breakup I think it's been the most valuable and the best time for me because I've learned so much about what I want and what I don't want and it's helped me to grow so much as a person and I always say to people when you're younger you should date Mm -hmm. because a lot of people feel that you know when when you're younger you want to marry the first person that you're with right everyone thought their 18 year old boyfriend was going to be their husband (laughs) Well, I did anyway. <laughs> that did not happen. But, you know, I think when you're when you've broken up with someone or when you're angry with someone, when you want to break up with them, you can only think of the bad things that they've done to you. Mm. And then when you've kind of had space to reflect and some time to think and calm down, you can only think about the things that they did well mm. and you love them even more. And then you're you're grieving that person who was like the perfect person, but it's actually a figment of our imagination. Yeah, we actually do that as a coping strategy. It's it's something that we are programmed to do that we sort of see people through rose tinted glasses and put them on this pedestal and think that they were just these mm. amazing things that we've now lost out on. Yeah, And I, f- I find that quite fascinating because it's often not the case, but the, the former thing that you said about, you know, demonizing the other is something we're very quick to do and I speak about it in the book as the perpetrator and the victim and we we fall into this pattern of them being the wrongdoer we are the victim and whilst I understand how that's easy to do one it's incredibly disempowering two it's like a very sort of low energy and, and you can stay stuck in that forever yeah and there's a safety in playing the victim because y- you aren't responsible for things right. and things have happened to you and you don't didn't play a part in that and just poor little old me mm. whereas if you can flip that and actually recognize that we both possess both you know through the prism of someone else's lens like 
they, and I, I found that so interesting observing people and also through my own relationships, how you can have one view of something going a certain way and the other person who shared the exact same experience yes. sees it totally differently. And both are valid and both are true. So true. So if you can kind of take that off and not demonize the other person, I think that's also a really important thing. Perception is reality was one of the quotes that my lecturer told me. I remember thinking, what are you talking about? But it's true. Yeah. My perception is my reality mm -hmm. and your perception is your reality. And we can experience the exact same thing and both will be facts to either of us because we are all so different. And I think that's where that communication kind of comes in and that vulnerability comes in because if you admit something and you're more vulnerable to talking about it, you're able to understand someone else's perception. Mm -hmm. And you're Bridge able to get, exactly. I'm so excited to read your book. I am so sad you didn't bring it on this so I can <laughs> point it up and tell everyone. But I am really excited to read your book and you know, I love your podcast. So thank you so much for coming here. Oh, thank you for and having sharing. Me everyone and thank you so much for listening and watching this podcast wherever you're listening or watching if you could please press the follow like and subscribe button it would really mean the world to me